the pharmaceutical gases often come into direct contact with either the final product or product intermediates. And therefore, these need to comply with GMP requirements. Regulations such as EU GMP, FDA, and the European Pharmacopoeia do not define pharmaceutical gas quality for individual applications. I'm sure many of us are confused what to do, what regulations to follow. And to tell us about this, we have Stefan, who will present an overview of applicable regulations, norms, guidelines, and also some common practices. Good afternoon, I am Uday Shati, and you're watching another session of Pharma Best Practices webinar. Really fortunate and happy and glad to have Stefan, who is an expert in this utilities in pharmaceutical gases. Let me say a few words about Stefan. Stefan has MSc in Utility Engineering, and he is pursuing MSc in Pharmaceutical Microbiology. He works for Boringer Ingelheim since 2002, and his role is global governance, critical utilities. He is providing support to all pharmaceutical sites in the network. This support is hands-on site support, audit response, troubleshooting, training, site improvements, and much more. He is member of Global ISP Critical Utilities Group, where he did contribute to a number of ISP good practices guide. He is also a member of the Medical Gases Working Group of the German Pharmacopoeia Commission. So without much ado, it is my pleasure to hand over this virtual platform to Stefan for his presentation. Over to you, Stefan. Thanks, Uday. Can you hear me? Very good. Yes, I so, can. So yeah. Hello, everybody. So hope you're you're doing okay so far. So today, I'll, today I, I try to shed some light on the the GMP requirements for pharmaceutical gases, and this also um, includes clean compressed air. Um, so I'll I'll keep the introduction short. So after after Uday's introduction, so yeah, I'm I'm working for BI since 20 years. Um, I used to work in a local engineering function for 14, 15 years, and I'm now in a corporate role in our global um, quality organization. Um, yeah, like Uday said, so Beringer is a global pharmaceutical company. We produce human pharma products as well as um, animal health products. Um, and we have around 25 sites globally and almost use pharmaceutical waters and pharmaceutical gases at all of those sites. Um, yeah, pharmaceutical gases. So I, I have to admit, so four or five years ago, um, pharmaceutical gases have played a, I would say, significantly smaller role in my day-to-day -day work than, than pharmaceutical waters. But um, I would say since a few years, so three, four years, um, we have, um, and, and also other pharmaceutical companies have seen a rise in th this topic in, in authority inspection. And unfortunately, also as a consequence, uh, also in the um, numbers of observations that are um, popping up for us. Um, just quickly on the agenda, so we have done the introduction already. So then we'll see where our pharmaceutical gas is used. We'll have a look into the regulations. Um, then, of course, you create your specification out of the regulations. Um, quick look into materials of construction. Qualification validation is quite important. Um, sterile application or, or control strategies for filters we'll have. Monitoring sampling. Um, then I'll brought some uh, example observations from the FDA, but also um, some, some other observations. Then um, I will just quickly talk about an opportunity for benchmarking that's currently running, and then we'll go into the question and answer session after, I would say, 50, 55 minutes, roughly. So, applications. Um, in general, there's um, a certain confusion when it comes to the difference between pharmaceutical and medicinal gases. Um, and, and I would say not all the regulations are, are very helpful there, um, but, but in general, you, you can see here, so medicinal gases, are 
normally used directly to treat the patient. So in a hospital or in a uh, home care situation with, with oxygen, for example. Um, pharmaceutical gases, um, they are used in the production of pharmaceuticals. So either becoming part of the product or, or used in a pharmaceutical process for blanketing, for example. Um, there's a variety of gases used. Um, of course, you've, you have um, clean compressed air, so almost every site has clean compressed air. Um, and then you have the two, I would say, inert gases that are dominant. This is the one is nitrogen, the other one is argon. Um, and then you have oxygen and carbon dioxide. Um, they're also quite often used in the pharma industry. Then there are, I would say, some exotics, but um, so those four, including compressed air, they're probably 95% of, of the gases used for um, pharmaceutical productions. So just some examples. Um, so for example, for solid dosage forms, so everything everywhere. So mixing, hardening, granulation, drying, pressing, packaging, um, so the pharmaceutical gases, so for, for packaging, for example, it's most likely it's compressed air, clean compressed air, comes into contact with the product or at least with the um, um, packaging material. Um, so at least for solid dosage, solid dosage forms, you, you see it in almost every manufacturing process. Then we have, of course, um, biotechnology fermentation processes. Um, for, for fermentation processes, um, we use gases like either compressed air or oxygen um, or carbon dioxide to, to regulate the growth. So if we want more growth, we use compressed air or oxygen. And if we want to um, slow down the growth a little bit, then we use um, carbon dioxide for it. Um, bottling, packaging. So you, for example, you blow out um, bottles or, or packaging materials to remove some, some dust before it really goes into um, the packaging line. Um, also, for example, for packaging lines, you, you try to uh, have the, the moisture or the, the, um, the water content under control because then um, the gluing is, is working better. Then we have, of course, um, instrumentation air. Um, that's generally used to, I don't know, drive actors or, or, or valves in a, in a clean room environment. Um, but then this compressed air, of course, um, comes into contact with the clean room. So you also want to have some level of control here. Um, compressed air is, for example, also used when you dry some, some drug products or drug substances. Um, here in this case, they're uh, also sometimes assisted with uh, vacuum. Blanketing is, is a quite often used application. Um, so nitrogen and argon um, are used to um, separate either the, the intermediate or the product or the process from the oxygen um, in the environment. Um, it's also used in sterile fill finish operations. So again, to separate the product um, from the um, microorganisms in the environment. Um, or clean compressed air, for example, is also used to purge products between vessels. So if you don't wanna use a pump, you can also um, use clean com or clean compressed air is also used as a um, method to transfer the products. So we've seen the applications, now comes the regulations. Um, so from a regulations perspective, I, I focused on EU and US. So um, in Europe, we have, of course, the, the famous or infamous um, Annex 1 for the manufacture of sterile products. Um, then we have Annex 15 for validation and qualification. Then we have Annex 6, which is not relevant for pharmaceutical uh, end users, um, but it's relevant for the for the companies that are producing the bulk gases like oxygen or, or nitrogen. So they have to follow this. Um, and then we have the respective monographs like um, air medicinal, we have nitrogen and oxygen. There's 
away more, um, but uh, at least for the applications we're using, we normally only reference to nitrogen and oxygen. Um, the, the setup in the US is um, comparable. So you have the um, famous guideline sterile drug products produced by aseptic processing. And then you have, again, um, USP monographs on um, the respective gases. And then again, so in, in gray, we have some um, monographs or regulations in the USP on, on, on testing of those gases, but uh, they don't necessarily apply to um, the really pharmaceutical use. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a draft um, from, from Annex 1. That's why it's uh, written in, in, in red. Um, so you see here, it's, I, I hope, I don't know, I hope it's the last draft and it's also the latest draft. Um, I don't know how many we, we will still see. Um, they were telling me this since two years. Um, but um, the Annex 1 states cl quite clearly that gases that come into direct contact with the product or the primary container surfaces should be of an appropriate chemical, particulate, and microbial quality. And then all relevant parameters, including oil and water content, should be specified. And then, of course, you have to take into account the, how the gas is used, um, the type of the gas, what's the generation system. So I'm coming to this later. And then where applicable, um, you have to comply with the current monograph. And I, I don't like the where applicable because that's um, not, not very helpful. And then there's a chapter on the, uh, I would say use of, of filters um, for, for gases there. Um, then we have um, Annex 15. So here they say quite clearly the, the quality of steam water, air, and other gases should be confirmed following installation using qualification steps. Um, then also here, um, I mean, this does normally not apply to pharmaceutical gases, um, but then here the period and extent of qualification um, should be also reflect the intended use of the utility. So that means there's a risk assessment um, required. and this is um, basically uh, uh, in EU, or if you want to follow the EU rules, you need to have a full validation, DQ, IQ, OQ, PQ, for your um, pharmaceutical gas system, including clean compressed air. Um, then this is the FDA guideline um, for sterile production. So they, they start equally as Annex 1, so after filtration, um, the quality or the purity should be equal or better than that of the air in the environment the gas is used. So um, that means you should not um, have a, a worse or, or, or uh, the clean room you are using the gas uh, is the reference for your um, specification for the filter. And also here, um, they have um, some words on the use of filters and when to test and uh, what to consider. Then we have, of course, um, a lot of guidelines from um, ISPE. So um, first and foremost, I would say it's the, the, the guide on, on, on process gases. Um, so I'd say the, the only I wouldn't call it a weakness. So the only thing that's that's missing because the, gate, the guide is a, a bit older is it was before Annex 15. Um, so the, the validation chapter here um, is probably not the best reference. So you, you find something um, better here in the, so this is for example, uh, quite new. I think this came out last year. I think it was last year. Um, there's some good, um, Guide, guidance also in here. Um, there's also an interesting uh, interesting chapter here on, on sampling um, in the sampling guide. And then you have um, for the, let's say different um, production processes, you have also um, the one or the other chapter or paragraph in, in the baseline guides for sterile 
um, production or for biopharmaceutical production and also for um, OSD plants. Then um, the famous or infamous um, ISO um, standard. So this is um, quite often used the, and oh, forgive me. So I have, so there is a, there's a mix up here. So it should be 8573. Um, the, the ISO standard is, is um, constructed the following. So you have basically um, chapter one talking about how to specify it. Um, and then parts two to nine. Um, so this is then here is how to test for the specified um, contaminants. Um, it's not necessarily a, a pharma standard, but um, I would see in, in nine out of 10 um, specifications, the, this um, ISO 8573 from 2010 is, is mentioned. So that's, it's really um, a global um, applied um, ISO standard. Then um, the last major um, guideline there is, there's a, a PICS guide, inspection of utilities, and they have um, also a section on um, pharmaceutical gases. So what, that's more a guideline for the inspectors on, on, on where to look. Um, and we have seen um, some observations in uh, in other companies, especially here on the air inlet source contamination risks. And I, I just have I've brought a picture here. Um, so this is the the air um, that is um, before it's being compressed. Um, and then this is after being compressed. And of course, you, you only compress the air, so not the particles or the, the microorganisms. So that means you um, have the same number of microorganisms in a smaller volume. Um, and this is why a lot of inspectors are really focusing on the air in that source. And then if you have um, an appropriate level of control there, and if you have um, an appropriate level of, of filtration. So this is where the guidelines, let's go directly to the specifications. Um, so in general, um, I would say, um, specifications must be established for uh, clean compressed air and pharmaceutical gases. So you know, also we had one, uh, one observation that we, we haven't had an, uh, a specification for a pharma pharmaceutical gas. We weren't using that, not that often, but still we were using it. So it was a, a, fair, a fair observation. Um, but in general, every gas compressed air, um, so if they come even potentially into contact with the product, um, you, you should have um, a specification. Also gases that become part of the product, so hat space gas or um, propellant. So if you have a, a meter dosed inhaler, for example, um, or for the transport of the product, um, or if you regulate the growth, um, that is also, um, you have to have a specification for there, um, which we don't do and which is, um, basically nobody doing in the industry is, is combustion gases. So if you use um, propane, for example, to um, to seal the ampules, um, so this is not considered a, a product contact um, gas. And so you don't need a specification for that. So um, normally if you have a pharmaceutical gas, um, then you need oil, or hydrocarbon as a parameter um, par being part of the specification. Um, if you have a pharmaceutical gas like nitrogen or oxygen, and if it's um, generated with a cryogenic generation process, you, you, there's no need to specify it because there's no chance in this cryogenic process that there's um, oil coming into the gas. Um, but for, for clean compressed air, for example, if you generate it for yourself, you, you need it. Or um, also um, if you generate your own oxygen or nitrogen with a process that is very similar to clean compressed air, um, then you need to specify this hydrocarbon content or oil content. Um, particles, 
uh, microbial, I think that's this is um, quite clear. Humidity, um, or I would say 90% are expressing it as pressure dew point, um, should be part of the specification. And then, of course, um, purity, but this is only applicable for really for the bulk gases. So if you want to have I don't know, oxygen with 93% or 95%. I think there's something coming up with 98% or, um, so that's up to you. What's your, what does your process need? Um, just a, a few points on the, the pressure dew point. Um, it's another, it's another word and at most of the companies I know, uh, <clears throat> they're you sorry they're using pressure dew point as as the um how they express um the parameters um the the ispe guide recommends around minus 40 for sterile and non-sterile applications and the reason for this is that there's um two or three um literatures or two or three studies um from the food industry um that where you can come to the conclusion that at a pressure dew point of, of around minus 26, um, you stop any microbial growth. And so if you transfer this into the ISO 8573 um, language, this means, so ISO class three is minus 20 um, and ISO class two is minus 40. So um, if you really wanna stop the microbial growth, you, you most likely go then here, and this is then also the um, ISPE recommendation. And here you see a um, uh, pressure dew point sensor. I think that's a Vaisala, probably, yeah. Um, purity, uh, I think like I said, so purity is often um, coming out, out of the monograph. Um, so if you, you're saying you're using nitrogen or you're using oxygen 95, um, but it's also depending, of course, on the intended use. So, I mean, you still can do blanketing um, of your process or even of your pharmaceutical water system of the, of the tank with, I don't know, um, I wouldn't say uh, uh, inferior quality of nitrogen, but I think you don't need the purest of the purest qualities that's, that's available. Um, oil content indeed is also um, mandated if you reference to a pharmacopoeial monograph, um, but, in general, the risk that this oil content um, possesses, and then also for you, the, the necessary level of control really depends massively on the production process of the gas and also in, on the um, intended use of the gas. Um, I think I mentioned it in one of our slides before. So cryogenic processes, there's normally no possibility that you get oil into the gas, whereas you're talking compression processes, there is, even with oil-free compressors, um, there's still the possibility that you get um, oil in with the, <clears throat> sorry, with the um, air from the outside. So for example, if there's a truck and you have the diesel um, exhaust fumes. Um, and so just, just one other thing, so, um, I just heard this um, a few times from a from a German inspector, um, and and he said so. Normally, the non uh, so compressors that are are um, using oil as a lubricant, um, they're not they they they're not considered state of the art for sterile production processes. So so if at least in in Germany, um, you have to have a good risk assessment and. If you're then buying new, uh, I think you, nobody would buy um, a compressor that is still lubricated with oil. So everybody's then going to to oil-free. But oil-free does not mean you're it's totally free of oil. It's just you don't lubricate with oil anymore. So um, for particles and microbial, that's uh, actually quite easy. So um, there's just two points to consider. So either, um, like here from the FDA, it says um, should be equal or better than the, the uh, environment in which the gas is used. Um, and then you just have to here decide, okay, uh, also sterile or non-sterile process. And then it comes um, to the fil filtration.
Um, so that's that's how you normally um, specified specify this kind of um, clean compressed air. Um, so um, just quickly something on roots of, of microbial contamination for clean compressed air systems. So um, outside air, depending on where you are and what time of the year you are, so you can have between 100,000, a million and, and 100 million uh, microorganisms in your um, in your outside air that you're using, um, all consisting of all kind of things like like so this is a uh, uh, so viruses, bacteria, or here molds. So it depends really on the time of the year and and what's what's happening around you. Um, and then here um, the, the microorganisms are are concentrated. condensate um, development. Um, how to control it? So you normally separate and remove um, all moisture from the from the compressed air. You have uh, filters to reduce the water aerosols. Then, um, like, like mentioned before, you reduce the dew point to a level that will that that will inhibit or or stop depends on what you want. Um, the growth of the microorganisms. Then again, you have higher class filters to reduce the number of microorganisms. And then, if you have a sterile application, you have additional filters um, that that are really taking out all the organisms. Uh, St Stephen, just uh, you know, I think there is some issue with your voice. So I think if you can just turn off your video. Uh, people, it would be clear. I think there is some connectivity issue, network bandwidth issue. I would think I'm, I'm getting some messages that my that I have to turn on my camera. Let me just do this quickly. Um, so, um, yeah. Uh, I think it's a good idea to validate your pharmaceutical gas system. Um, I would say for also for compressed air, um, I would say two thirds um, the companies I know, they have also the generation being part um, of the validation process. Um, for pharmaceutical gases, um, you tend to have a validated supplier. They own the storage tank in your facility and um, then you have your validated distribution systems with um, sampling. With sampling, so environment location. So you normally start into direct or product contact surfaces, and even if it's just potentially coming, um, I would say the simple gases we're using they're quite stable and and do not degrade. So um, no need for any kind of stability. Um, so that's that's um, why the, the risk assessments are normally quite quite simple here. Um, IQ. I um, think there's not much, not much magic here. So you're, um, of course, have the documentation part um, components. So are, are they already? Can you identify them, or are they, 
uh, the, the tax there, labels there, um, technical documentation. So if the um, if the assembly or the installation is really like the the PID, then you have of course here also the material certificates, um, surface states. So does that work? Um, and then here accessibility of the sampling points. That's um, actually quite uh, important for the monitoring later. So you really want to check this. Um, OQ, you then, of course, you um, demonstrate how the components are working. Um, if you have, um, you purge the lines or you, you clean the lines, um, it depends um, if you have a, uh, nitrogen system, you purge normally your system first with clean compressed air, so it's, it would be a huge waste if you really purge it with nitrogen. Um, then, of course, if you have online instruments there or any instruments, you need to calibrate them. Um, you also so and that's. It's more an EH. Stephen, I think there is a problem with your uh, order than uh, than for a water system. Stephen, Stephen, uh, Stephen, yeah. just one sec. Uh, I think your slides are frozen. They're not moving. Can you just uh, refresh that? And because people lost connect, there was no sound coming. It was cutting off from your side. Can you hear me, Stefan? Stefan, can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, uh, Delegates, uh, just wait for a minute. We're trying to get in touch with Stefan. I think he's having a problem with his connectivity. Just give us a uh, just give us a few minutes to sort this out. <clears throat> Hello, Stephen. We're not able to hear you. Stephen, we are not able to hear you. Uh, it's showing that you're not connected to audio. So just to see that you're connected to the audio.
a delegate still have to give us some more time. I'm not able to get in touch with Stefan uh, on his mobile phone. So just please give us few some more time. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Now we can hear Stefan. Yes. Okay. There was I don't know something with the power here. Um, okay. Can, can you make me a presenter again? Yeah, yeah, I'll make it one sec. And then can you roughly tell me at which slide we broke? Yeah, I'll tell you. Yeah, I'll tell you. I have, see, has, have you got this thing on your, have you got the control? Yes. Yeah, you should have got the control now. I can see your screen, yeah. I think. Yeah. Good. So can you see my screen? No, not yet. Yes, now I can see your screen. Yeah, now it's full screen. Are you speaking now? Because I can't hear you. No, Stefan, I can't hear you. Yeah, I can see your screen, but we can't hear you. Yes, now I can see you, but I'm not. Okay. Uh, yeah, now I can hear you. It's all, it's all, everything is correct. So which okay. slide? So let me ask the uh, the people who are attending. Uh, can you just tell us uh, uh, if any any one of you can please just type in the chat that from which slide you lost the connectivity, please? Yeah, I think Stefan, it was from qualification, I think so. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. Okay. Um... No, I think microbiology slide number 34, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's close this. Um, where was my acrobi microbiology? So, okay, good. Um, so in order to make the time, I'm probably rushing this a bit, but. No, no. Um, take, take, take your time. No problem. We have sufficient time. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so there's some some just some words on the roots of, of microbial contamination. So um, outside air, depending where you are, you have I would say between half a million, a million, or even hundred million of microorganisms um, per cubic meter in your in your outside air that you're then compressing. So you have um, everything. I mean, just the pointer. So yeah, there's of viruses. You have bacteria. You have molds. So and when you depending just on the time of the year and, and in the area where you are. Um, and then you're compressing this here um, in, in, in the generation unit. Um, there is some heat development between, I don't know, probably 80 to 100 degrees, um, but that's normally not sufficient because the, um, the time that the microorganisms spend at this elevated temperature is not, um, not long enough. So, and then you're concentrating like you saw it in the in the one picture. And then um, if you really don't control the dew point, um, you, you have wet air um, and you have condensate generation. So this is then normally where you have your um, microbial growth starting. Um, to control it, um, you need to apply several steps. So in the beginning here, you you separate and remove all moisture from the compressed air. Um, with then you have of course filters um, to further reduce um, the water aerosols. Then um, you have dryers um, that then reduce the dew point to a level that will either inhibit or or really stop the growth of microorganisms. And then you filter as a final step um, the air a bit more to reduce um, the microorganisms. And then for sterile applications, you then have of course, um, further sterile filter to capture all the 
microorganisms that are there. So validation. Um, I think at least for for EU, it's quite clear um, that you need to have a DQ, IQ, OQ, PQ. Um, so this normally applies. Um, the, the scope varies a bit. So um, for for clean compressed air generation systems, so you have companies that are just I would say using commissioned only. Um, so this means they they only have let's say um, a good commissioned um, generation system and then they validate the distribution system but i would say the trend in the last years is really going into um, generation and distribution distribu distribution is part of the um, validation package for um, pharmaceutical gases um, it's a bit different than normally you have a validated supplier like air liquid for example um, they normally supply the storage tank on your side and then there is a handover to you. So, but normally the storage tank um, is not part of your validation package. You have a handover um, and then you validate from there. Um, user requirements, um, again, everything that comes into direct contact or potentially contact with the product or product contact surfaces. Um, but um, there's not much um, so it's it's simple gases, so they're also quite stable, um, and they they do not degrade over time. Um, so that makes at least uh, a few parts of the risk assessment quite quite simple. Then um, IQ, no um, nothing nothing magic here. Um, so you you have chapter of documentation where you check the PNID, isometrics, material certificates, test certificates. Uh, then you have, um, of course, the assembly or the installation. Then you check if they are labeled correctly. This this kind of stuff is is um, quite important. Then you have um, also here. So this is quite important for for later when you're monitoring. So the um, accessibility of of sampling points. Um, so this is um, really quite important, especially um, if you want to have a reference point somewhere close to the point of use because you can't sample the point of use, then you really have to think before um, about sampling. Then OQ, also no magic here. It's really then um, more the functioning of the components. Um, you confirm that you've purged or cleaned the um, distribution system. So for for gases, you know, you can also purge with um, clean compressed air and then fill the system with uh, with the pharmaceutical gas. Otherwise, it would be really a huge waste if you um, purge your nitrogen system with nitrogen until it's clean. Calibration of the devices, um, air tightness is a, is a very important point. Um, to save some money, so if your system is not tight, you're really losing a lot, a lot of money, um, because then the air is escaping and you're constantly producing um, alarms. In case you have online um, instruments for pressure or for dew point or for for oil, for example, um, filter integrity um, is tested or or documented, and then also you have kind of a maximum distribution test. To <clears throat> sorry to see if you have multiple demands, if the system is still capable of supplying all. Then PQ, um, like I said, so you should consider the, the um, system boundaries. So if the generation is part of it or not, or if the um, tank is from a vendor or if it's your tank. So seasonal variations is mentioned in Annex 15. Normally it's at least not reflected in the PQ. Um, and then, of course, you have here, um, have to consider also to have a risk-based sampling plan. So based on the room class, intended use, uh, method of generation or, or source of the gas, or also so, um, the source where you get your um, air that you compress in. Um, PQ is this just... Um, very different to to a water system, so you you really have only really a limited number of days, um, and you're you're just verifying here that the 
that the quality of the gas at the critical point is is more or less consistent with the um, specifications that you have or the the user requirements. Um, you test at the point of use or at the reference point or both um, that that you are um, within specification in terms of particles, bio burden, and then you have the the um, physical properties like oil or moisture or pressure dew point. Um, I would say industry average is three days or the majority of the companies are doing three days of sampling. Um, some are doing five days uh, and then you have a variety, um, I would say. So three days of sampling, some companies sample three consecutive days, some companies sample three points over the course of a week to simulate a bit more or over the course of 10 days. So this is, um, yeah, um, you, you see everything, but uh, not more than five days, um, I, I would say. Um, what's what's also quite important is, is to see um, the, the point of views. So, um, for example, if your point of use is in a in a sterile area, then you really want to make sure that you also relate this example. I mean, you, you can probably test it while the clean room is still in in commission, but um, during monitoring later, you it's very a, a large disruption of the clean room if the sampling personnel goes in there. So this is also the point where you establish um, reference points. Um, the the sam or the yeah the, the sampling plan you have for PQ is that that's like a water system. You you normally then start, go into routine monitoring with this plan, um, and then only using the reference points or the the points of use you've established, and then go from 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 there. Um, like I said. The, the quality is, is normally not influenced by seasons. I mean, Annex 15 is, is mentioning it, but um, this is something you you then see more in, in a routine, but normally you close your qualification after three days um, of sampling. Then uh, when you're done, you release it. Um, so that's um, also, again, there's not, not much magic there. Um, so this is then basically like any other qualification. So you um, demonstrated that the system is fit for it uh, for its intended purpose, and then you can use it. Um, and your your report should just confirm this. Um, for bulk pharmaceutical gases, so th this is normally where you have the the, the border here. So everything left, or sometimes the filter is, is also ours, that, that really depends a little bit. Um, so this is normally here, the vendor, or here, um, this is really depends. Or you, if you have a, a bulk storage tank, or if you have, like you see here on the this one, um, if it comes more in, in, um, in batteries of bottles, um, this is, um, this is something you really need to consider in your validation. So which is the boundary? So what is us and what is what is the vendor? Um, On-site generation, this is the same. So normally this is this is here included. So you see some pictures here of a, of a cooler dryer and then you go into a buffer tank. Um, so you have to really um, describe in your validation what is part of it and what is not part of it. So um, I think you'll see this this drawing quite often. So I've taken and adapted it a bit from the from the ISP guide. So there's um, a, a lot of ways to set up a um, distribution system and also then then sampling. So here you have your your point of views. That means you, at some point you have an inline filter, but you only have here. Um, a system reference point that means during validation you test both of them and then you establish um, kind of a relation and then um, if you cannot measure this point your um, reference point serves then as a um, um, surrogate 
for, for this point. Um, then, of course, you can also have here again system reference point, but then you have some some reference really directly um, before the filter, and you can can uh, and then again in validation you you demonstrate that this uh, and this result are are the same, and then you also have um, a, a process for the filter so so that you can really make a good argument saying okay if I have the right quality here and the filter is integer, um, I'm 100% sure that I'm also having the right quality um, at the point of use. That's a bit of a different setup where you say, okay, for example, everything that enters the aseptic core, um, I'm establishing the same logic here. So you have an array of points of uses and you're just measuring the line that goes into the aseptic core and then you have um, multiple use points, but again, um, you're making this, or you're establishing establishing this reference during during validation. Um, also, yeah, not of course not every every system has a final uh, inline filter, so um, this is um, a bit comparable then to uh, to to here. Um, again, it's all depending on what you what you want to demonstrate so but you really have to make a distinction between a system sample point and a reference point a reference um, sample point um, same basically here where you say okay i have a, a number of of use points and I, I can try to group them and this is where i take my my reference point here um, and then for compressed air this is um, comparable to the setup to the setup to um, always depends on your on your application. So this, I would say, this is quite a normal setup if you're um, having higher grade clean rooms and you not necessarily want to have sampling personal sampling this or or, or this or this point because that's a massive um, disruption for the for the clean room. Um, yeah, still sampling location should be selected to reference to reflect the quality of the pharmaceutical gas at the point of use. Um, but uh, again, so yeah, you, you just have to really um, decide what's what's worth more to um, disrupting your your clean room integrity or establishing establishing a reference during during validation. Um, so. Just some some examples where where you you tend to sample. So it's either, for example, at the end of a distribution line serving each floor. So that means you, you then have you're going um, into a distribution in a in a production area, or you have a, a filter before you go into a building. Um, although I think it's kind of hard to establish this relationship between building and then point of use, but. Um, then you have before and after the final filter. So this is normally what you do to establish a reference point. And then you also use the most remote point in the system because then you have you tend to have the, the lowest pressure and the highest likelihood of accumulating particles or whatever is, could be potentially in, in, in your system. Um, so this is just some, some um, uh, I would say, Industry averages. So for for particles and bio burden, you you have minimum three working days. Um, I'd say majority really are using three working days for this, um, with some variations. For oil, um, depends, but also three three working days um, is okay. And then you have the, or if you have an online instrument, um, there's of course no need to. Um, say we're using three working days, so you just make the same cut with the particles and then also for moisture. So for moisture, I would say there's more um, online instruments than for oil, but um, yeah. Good. Um, materials of construction. Um, there's a lot of um, materials available. Um, say this is, um, for example, aluminium, so that's it is used, but not used very often. Then you have some kind of plastics um, that that are used. Then we have um, oh no, this is aluminium. This is stainless steel. So aluminium, not not so much used. Um, then we have 
stainless steel. This is um, quite often used. So normally you start uh, I would say outside of a clean room, you can still use copper, but copper is not very compatible with the cleaning agent you're using in, in pharmaceutical clean rooms. Um, so um, I would say distribution to the clean room, um, you see a lot of copper and then you switch either to stainless steel or um, this is um, very a, a large trend in Europe. So that's a, this is a metal plastic composite. So you see the, the inner lining um, is, is plastic and it has an aluminum core to stabilize and then it has a an outer um, out of core, uh, no, 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 out of core and outer um, rim with plastic, so just to protect um, it. Um, super light, very easy to to install. Um, can hold a lot of pressure, so um, it's this is really um, coming up at the last, I don't know, five to ten years in in, in Europe, um, very massively. And so the connections are pressed, so it's it's quite quite easy to install. A lot of fittings available. Um, that's, that is really quite good. So I would say these three is what you see um, most often. Then um, just a bit on, on filtration. So you've, you've seen this picture and I, I, I'm, I'm using it quite often. So normally you have this system filters. I'm not a big fan of the filters. Um, I think, Stephen, again, we are not able to hear you. Yeah, today is a bit a bit jinxed. No, no, no. Now it's clear. Please go ahead. I think you can just switch off your video. I think that will be better. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I will. I will do this. Yeah, but now it's clear. Okay, good. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Um, and the same is then also for the for the um, compressed gas. So depending on your application. Just close the door again. Um, you either have an inline filter or your your um, your product does not require it, so then you um, can can skip it. Um, the the FDA and also the the European authorities they really want to have um, a risk assessment. They want to see an, a risk assessment on when you test the filter um, and and why. So um, some of the outcomes can be, for example, you test it before use, after use, um, or you have a fixed interval, or you have a batch relation, or um, this is also mentioned by the FDA. Um, if you have events that could potentially decrease the filter integrity, or that is um, um, contributing to the aging of the filter, like like sterilization, um, for example. So um, this is really where they want to see some um, documentation by you that you've thought about this. Um, also, um, what you should consider is, okay, are the materials in the filter, are they really suitable for the sterilization method? Um, can they stand the temperatures? Um, you really want to make sure that your filters are really working. So if they tend to get wet and the differential pressure is in increasing, so before they rupture, that you get an alarm. Um, sample port at, at the filter or uh, around the filter installations are, are also very helpful. Vendor certificates um, is uh, also something you can really use because normally, or you need to have, um, because normally you you're just testing the integrity 
um, in situ, but you still rely, of course, on the rating from the manufacturer. And of course, you, you, there is an expectation that you have, have a procedure that covers all the event in the life cycle of a filter. So when to test, when to change, what to do with an alarm. So everything around the filter um, should be covered um, in a procedure, especially if it's for a sterile um, application. So monitoring, I think you see the same picture then again. Um, the, at least for a clean compressed air, it, it's a bit comparable to a pharmaceutical water system. So um, you can sample in or after the generation. I would say after the generation is, is um, for a normal operation better than really um, a validation. Um, then you have sampling in the distribution system, um, sampling at the point of use and sampling at a reference point. Um, so then um, at least for, for larger operations, they tend to have online instruments for oil and pressure dew point, um, at least in the generation or immediately after the generation is um, not so unusual um, anymore. And then of course, you have to assess all sampling points and then you can make a risk assessment saying, okay, I'm, I'm just sampling here at the reference point because I established during the validation that this sampling point um, reflects the quality at the point of use. Um, then of course, there's monitors you, uh, parameters you really um, continuously monitor and, and discontinuously monitoring um, is applied to other parameters. So pressure, um, that's more a process control parameter, temperature also, um, flow. Then you have um, pressure dew point, like I said. So it's normally this is done um, online, oil content. It's it's a bit expensive, but um, it's more and more coming, uh, at least for larger operations. Um, and at least it's it's quality relevant. But of course, you can also still work with these um, dragger tubes. They are, I would say, a bit unreliable, but or um, it's um, you, you need to be very good trained to to use them. Um, purity um, that's normally for example for nitrogen or for oxygen. Also here you rely. I think I have a certificate later, so you rely really on the data of the from the vendor. So for example, if they say, okay, there's this amount of CO2 um, on this amount of uh, SO2 um, in it, in your nitrogen, and you have a risk assessment that you have no possibilities to reintroduce these contaminants, um, you normally don't measure the purity then um, at the point of use, even in a discontinuous way. Um, then for for higher risk application, I think I mentioned it in the beginning. So for for um, non oil free generators, there are some some risk that that holes or ruptures of filters cannot be detected fast enough, and then you contaminate the system and and also downstream processes. So um, for non oil free generators, um, you really need to think about the the right level of control to make sure your system's not contaminated. Um, also for some older dryers or, or very moisture sensitive products, um, undetected malfunctions of the, of the dryers um, can really cause uh, um, condensation or at least a, a steep increase of, um, of moisture in, in the compressed air. Um, and this can lead to, to um, microbial issues, but also um, stability issues in the, in the product. So really, if, if you have a higher risk um, from, for the product or by your generation process, um, the level of control um, should be really appropriate to this, to this risk. Um, yeah, you, you're seeing the picture again. So I, I, um, I just uh, have it here back um, just for your um, understanding or that it's, um, that it's really important to, to understand where you're sampling and why you're why you're sampling um, so this is a an a, a receipt so it's in german but um this is a receipt we we get from our 
vendor, for example, here, Air Liquid, and I think I have it in a larger. So this is the certificate of analysis that, that we get with, with a shipment, for example. Um, and then they say here, okay, so this is, in this case, it's nitrogen. Um, we specified 99.5%. Um, and then they say, okay, um, the number of uh, the PPM, how many PPM of CO2 is in, how many PPM of um, CO is in, and how many PPM of oxygen are, are in. Um, and we don't verify this later at the point of use. Um, so we just say, okay, purity is, is good. Um, another important thing that's mentioned on the certificate is how this um, nitrogen was, was generated. And here you see it in, in, in German, but I, it sounds similar in English. So it's a, it's a cryogenic process. Um, and this is also then for us an, an indication that we, and it's exclusively, so it says exclusively by a, a cryogenic process. Um, so that's also a reason for us not to um, test for oil there. Um, there's other possibilities to generate nitrogen that works like a compressed air system. And then you have a you have this uh, compressed air running through a zeolite. Um, um, it's kind of a mineral. Um, and this um, separates the oxygen from the nitrogen. Um, and in this case, you would test for oil because it's it's a compression um, method. Here, the this is also so the dew point here of, of 80 to, to 95 Kelvin. So that's between 170 and two. Uh, so minus 170, minus 200. Um, so the dew point is also um, super low. And this is normally what you get with with every every shipment of, of nitrogen. So let me get, just go back one slide. So then you see here, this is the, the, the protocol. Um, this is the, the amount we're getting. And, and then it's also quite clear, okay, this is the batch from this manufacturer. Um, we are referencing here the pharmacopoeial monograph. This is then what, how we get to this um, specification. Um, but then we stop testing for these points. So um, then we're coming to inspection observations. Um, so this is, um, as you can see, an FDA observation. So um, here they just have that the compressed air is in contact with the primary pack packaging um, material, uh, and they did not not validate the system. So even if it's just the primary packaging material, um, the FDA expects here a, a full validation of the compressed air system. Um, then here, validation was not sufficient. So nitrogen used in the uh, lyophilizer was qualified um, on a specification only meeting clean room class C, but it was used in a clean room class A. Um, that's obviously um, a wrong specification. Um, you, you could be lucky if you have um, um, environmental data, environmental monitoring data showing that you're meeting clean room class A, then it's probably only a minor observation, um, but uh, still, so your, your specification should really be reflecting um, the intended use. And also, um, um, there was an observation where our routine monitoring frequency is not necessarily supported um, by the validation. Um, so that was probably a bit too um, enthusiastic, um, the reduction. So also again here, so you have to check your data and then you can um, start reducing the sampling points or the, the frequency or both. So, um, also here, so you see it's a similar theme. So the action level for compressed air for viable and non-viable particles is not aligned with the intended application. So that's um, a bit um, like like this one here. So um, yeah. And then here also they, they don't have, uh, obviously they, they don't had any alert levels also for, for this. So, um, and it was a product contact operation. So this was, um, yeah, probably a more severe 
stuff. Um, again, here, compressed air is generated on site and used in the packaging um, and has not been for, for, for packaging operation that has not been validated. Um, I think we've uh, established this by now um, that even for this application, um, you have the expectation is to to have a validation. So, and with that, we're we're coming to an end. So, um, at the moment, we're doing a benchmarking of. Uh, so, it's it's running at the moment. So we it's it's um totally anonymous. Um, so at the moment, we have about I don't know 20, 25. I think it's even more at the moment. Um, or now pharmaceutical companies, global operating companies, and there's questions on on um, specification, on sampling, on validation boundaries, and how long do you sample? So so this kind of stuff. So if anybody's interested, so I've pasted in the the QR code on the top right um, bottom, or if you're um, if you need to have a link, um, should just drop me a line in the comments and I'll, I'll send you the link. So you will get all the results. So so you will get yours and also the, the results of the other companies, but it's of course anonymous. So, so you would just see um, pharmaceutical manufacturer or any animal health manufacturer, Germany or India or Denmark. Um, so there's, yeah, so I think it's a it's an interesting uh, interesting opportunity. So um, for us, it's so what we're seeing at the moment for us, it's very very interesting. So we also um, op have um, the opportunity to discuss these points later um, with a certain group, or you can ask. Um, yeah, so it's a good opportunity. So if anybody's interested, use the QR code or ask for uh, for a link. And I think with that, um, I'm done. And I really apologize for my um, technical no problem. problems. Thanks, thanks, Stephen, for an excellent, detailed, exhaustive presentation covering so many aspects. If you want to send that link, you can just put it in the chat. I can put it to all, or even you can put it in the chat and it can go to all participants if you wish to do that. And we yes. will take questions. We'll take questions now. Okay, let me just uh, um, I'm gonna stop stop sharing now, and then I'm just looking quickly for the link. But I, I have to admit, I'm I'm not overly multitasking. Uh, no, it's okay. <laughs> the biggest multitasker. Um, so let me just get the link. Here is copy URL, um, and then I'll open it in the chat. We can send it to all. To organizers, okay. Yeah. So, um, like I said, um, it's it's totally anonymous. So I'm I'm the only person that that really um, administers it. And um, um, I, I mean, you, you should know me by now. So I'm 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 happy to answer any question. Um, if you yeah. If you okay. So just I think you send the link to me. I'll just send it to all. Oh, okay. So, oh, sorry. Uh, oh, yeah, I, I think you're not. right. You're right. Yeah. I just yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I've sent it to all the organizer. Thanks for covering me here, Yude. <laughs> no, it's done. Okay, uh, because there are many requests coming here for sharing the link, so I think everyone will get it. So here's the first question. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we'll take a few questions. Yeah, uh, sure, sure, sure. So where is it? Uh, must you have POU filters? And filters at generations. Um, so a filter after the generation, I would say, is is quite important, um, just to control um, the particles and also the the microorganisms. Point of use filters, um, I would say, is depending on the application. Um, so if it's a sterile application, I would say I would really say yes. Um, if you have a very good system, a very clean distribution system, um, if your dew point is low enough, so you don't have a chance that you have any form of corrosion in there, um, and you're just running a um, out of for a packaging operation, um, I would say it's not 
not necessary that you have a, a point of use filter. Right. Thank you. Let's move on. Uh, this is about testing and specifications. You did mention uh, the specifications of ISO 8573. So is it, uh, you know, how, what is the people, what do they follow? Do they do all the testing as per this or some of the test results are taken from the vendor? I think you did mention that, but there's a question on that. Okay, so um, so for for eight five seven three, um, I, I think this is the par the the parameters you really test at your point of use or or at your reference point. Um, coming from the vendor, you it's really more based on the purity aspects of the of the gas. So purity is normally tested at the vendors and not at your point of use. And the, the parameters you specify in the ISO is is really more tested at your point of use because that's interesting what's going into the product or process. Right. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Uh, this you you did mention detail about validations, how you know all the IQ, OQ, PQ, and other things. So here is a question on shutdown period. Uh, so for example, if there is a shutdown period of 10 days uh, then how you know when do, do you validate this or when, if you start after a shutdown period uh, what is the kind of procedure you would follow um okay so depending of course uh, what what type it is but let's let's for make it easy uh for a compressed air system so you you of course then start up um and then you 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 vent um, the line, so that means you you really should have a point where either you take a point of use or you have a special point for this, where you really make sure that you get um, the air that is was inside the system during the maintenance is blown out um, either into um, into a technical area or or over the roof, um, and then you sample. It depends, of course, how how good your your validation is, but normally. Um, you sample then at a reference point or at some selected reference points um, and then you can restart the system. Okay. If you're talking about a gas system, um, you normally um, purge it first or, or um, blow it through um, with clean compressed air and then you bring in um, your pharmaceutical gas and then you need to vent, of course, that you have um, or you need to have a procedure on how to how to open the system and vent it so that you really have the pharmaceutical gas um, everywhere and then yeah of course again some sampling um, especially um, for for particles so that's if you have a maintenance that's that's quite um, quite important but um, yeah maintenance is really so I mean just my personal opinion but for for clean compressed air the the, the single most um, important point is is the filters in the in the system and in right. the generation so you really have to make sure that you replace the filters with the right classification and um, that they're integer and then you're probably already quite safe. Right, thanks. Uh, there's a question on dew point. We had, yep. you presented quite a lot on that. Uh, since dew point tends to change during distribution, how should limit for dew point be fixed at user point in comparison to generation point? Um, yeah, um, but, but still, I mean, you, you're, so it's, it's at the generation, um, because this is where you have the, or, or this regulates the process, um, on, 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 on the drying. So, so, um, yes, your pressure might change, but that does not necessarily, that does not mean that the moisture content content also changes. It's just in relation to the pressure. Um, so the, the overall absolute content does not change and, and it's you're normally taking this um, immediately after the generation because this is how you have your process under control. That's right. right, thank you. Uh, let's move on. Is there, uh, next question is about contamination with Clostridium spots. Is there a risk of contamination of the compressed air line by Clostridium spores? Have you seen this kind of this kind of contamination? And if um, yes, what are the specific controls? Yeah, please. Go. So actually, actually, I have, um, I have never seen. Uh, so I have to be careful. So I'm, um, but 
I've I've really rarely seen a contamination in the system, so it was more or less always either the mm -hmm. sampling or the the handling of the samples. So normally these these systems they, they really come in come in quite clean. So you see excursions on on oil or water, but normally not from micro. Um, so I, I haven't seen it, and, and yes. um, but I, but I mean I can I can look. So I don't know. There's probably um, a reason behind the question. So either it's very small, or they can can survive very. Um, so they're re really mean. I don't know. But if the question is in the in the chat, so I'll, and you, I th I think you sent me the chat later. So I'll, yes. I'll try to I try to look for it. But normally, so I've I've never seen a system. I think Thank that was really contaminated. Thank you. Uh, now, this is about, uh, next question is about frequency of change of the filters for sterile and non-sterile applications. Any suggestions? What is your uh, what is your experience? Of course, it would be different for different companies, different uses based on the risk assessment and so on, but overall, your view and your... Uh, um, yeah, again, it's, 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 it's a bit, um, it's a bit hard. Um, so coming from the generation, it depends on how how good is your um, quality of air going into the process, um, and then um, yeah, you you really can't say. I mean, you you have you have um, pressure differentials for a for a reason, um, and then at least if you're talking for sterile applications for the sterile filters, um, uh, yeah, I mean. There's a number of sterilization cycles such filters can um, can tolerate without uh, any decrease in in, in quality, um, but yeah, it's it, it's hard um, because normally it's it's not so time dependent. It's more dependent on how many sterilization cycles over over the filter, and then <laughs> and again it depends on how how often do you use it. So um, it, it's it's hard to hard to say from here um yeah, absolutely more uh, really an operational uh experience thing yes uh now this is about uh, reference point uh if the reference point is in grade b area and point of views is in grade a uh i think you have answered this then which is the appropriate to point to sample yeah i mean i wouldn't even do I would even do the, the reference point in a grade B, so I would really try to get um, uh, to get out and, and establish the relationship because even in a grade B, um, you need to get somebody in from 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 the monitoring team. Um, you you need to blow um, to flush um, the the sample point, so it's it's really a massive disruption of the of the clean room. Um, so I really try would try to do the reference point even reference even in point. a grade C or D, um, and and you need to establish this relationship during during validation, saying okay, mm -hmm. so if I'm having that quality at my reference point and I have a process uh, taking care on the integrity of my filter, then I am I'm very very sure and I'm established this during the validation that the quality at my point of views at my real point of views is um, without a doubt. Yes. So I think there are several questions. So we'll just take one last one and then I'll send you all the chat and maybe then we can try to publish it as a blog or we'll see how to go about that. So let me think. Uh, which one should I take? Okay, yeah, let's take this one. This is a tricky one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you do you test nitrogen for microbiological quality? Um, yes, we do. Um, so there's still the possibility that that um, anaerobic um, bacteria are yes, are true. in in there, um, especially after commissioning of the system. Um, so you, they, I would see. There, there is some logic in saying, okay, so once you have the system running and and you you have a clean running system, that you reduce the frequency. But especially after maintenance or after uh, um, major interventions or or after a new system, it really makes sense to to monitor there because there's there's also bacteria that not necessarily need um, oxygen to absolutely 
or Absolutely. not yeah i mean there's they all need something but there's um yeah and they might they might be there just i mean this is also a method to say okay how good is my purging process or how good is my cleaning process so um, if you find some some spores in there um after or, or even some bacteria after um after maintenance or after um um after major interventions and then you really know that your your purging process is probably not the best and needs some improvement so um to answer the question yes it makes sense um but uh, in, a, in a routine operation you can probably um scale it back absolutely so thank you thank you stephen for the presentation yeah uh, and well again apologies for the technical difficulties no, it's okay it's final that's 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 no so before we conclude any final comments final concluding remarks and then we will uh, close this uh, webinar no um like i said so it was it was fun uh, except for the disconnections um and uh, yeah i'll try to answer the um, um all the questions i'm i'm probably i'm hoping i get it done until middle of next week um and whoever wants to be part of the benchmarking so i'll i'll looking looking forward to it and um i think we will share this then um once we see the number of um participants are plateauing so if we don't get any new we will share this probably i don't know uh, in a week or 10 days and then um uh how do you Great. say it so um we we won't share your details so i'm the only person seeing your details and you will get the results from me and if you have questions i mean you yeah just you can then just ask me okay thank and you thank you for the for the, yes my pleasure it's our honor so thank you delegates for joining here today in such large numbers uh we appreciate uh your support for this platform and this channel uh, please do join us on May 26th. We are having an interesting webinar uh, on revised Annex 1 draft. I think this is the version 15th of the draft GMP for sterile products. And please do join for this. Thank you so much. With this, we are closing. Have a have a good evening. Have a good weekend. And stay, uh, stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.